My name is Isaac Nenomo, and I'm the head of marketing, uh, digital, social, and creative at Amplify Africa. Um, I'm a musical creative, and I have a love and a heart for the diaspora for Africa. I'm first generation Nigerian, and um, and yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the panel in just a second, but I wanted to really quickly. Um, just remind everybody why it is that we're celebrating and what this summit is about, what Africa Day is about. So, Africa Day. This is the annual commemoration of the foundation of the Organization of African Unity, uh, the OAU, now known as the African Union. And on the 25th of May, 1963, it is celebrated, celebrated in various countries as well as around the world. And so, I just want to give you some quick about this day. Ghana gained independence from Britain in 1968. And so Africa Day was observed for the first time uh, the following year um, under the guidance of uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And it wasn't until around 1963 that with the recent uh, uh, freedom and independence of nations such as uh, Ghana, uh, previously uncolonized Ethiopia, Sudan, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, and Liberia, um, that this organization was founded and we're celebrating what we're celebrating today. And so just for people who are not so familiar with the Pan-African movement, this is an idea that African people, people of African descent are linked by more than just our common history, but also, so when these incredible individuals and African leaders got together some 57, 60 years ago, they had this idea that it would not just stop or end with them. It wasn't just about as soon as all the countries gain a, a liberation from colonization, then we can stop. Or as soon as you know South Africa is good, good, good or just America is good, then we're all good. It was about what is the common goal that we're all reaching. And so with that in mind, I like to introduce. I'm gonna start from for what for me. What is the bottom left hand corner? Please y'all uh, say what's good to Jesse Wu. Uh, Jesse Wu is an incredible artist, musician, comedian, writer, just goofy dance. I mean, this girl, she wears so many hats. I don't know where I should start. She's a host. Um, and uh, she is patient. She's a patient to say. She really, really is putting on for Haiti. This is uh, actually Haitian um, Heritage Month. So I know you're going to drop some knowledge on us real quick about that um, later on in this discussion. Um, also heading to the Caribbean with our friend, Keyboard Trim is a former professional athlete, a philanthropist, an entrepreneur, and the founder of LA Lime. Uh, and uh, a good friend of Amplify Africa, as all of you are. To my, what is my list? <laughs> I'm doing this, right? I'm gonna confuse myself with all of you. <laughs> I'd like to introduce my good friend, Professor Fumi Lola Fagbamila. Uh, Fumi is an incredible playwright, uh, professor, activist, artist. Um, and we're gonna get into definitely more about what her work um, encompasses a little bit later. Um, please also meet Brett Roberts. He is a uh, City uh, planner for the city of Inglewood. He is also a world traveler. He corrected me the other day. I was like, How many countries have you been to? Like 50? He was like, It was 60. <laughs> I said, Excuse me. I'm sorry. So uh, definitely has has a lot more of a world view than like a physical a physical world. For a lot of the average people just based on the amount of, of countries and cultures that he's been able to view. Um, next up, we have Daps. This guy just was just one name, like Beyonce. <laughs> he is an incredible uh, entrepreneur. Uh, he is an incredible uh, video director. Y'all have seen his work. I don't even know. Like, you start naming the roster of stuff that you've seen, such as all of the the, the catalog for the Migos. Um, you know that Cardi B twerk video. Okay, and he's also uh, the founder of. Uh, so we're definitely gonna get into that. He's also a resident Black Briton, so even though he be code switching, so <laughs> that, who are we gonna go today? Which accident are we gonna get today? <laughs> All right, and then last but certainly not least, uh, our 2019 amplifier of the year, Miss Melat Bekele. I had to call Melat the first time I was gonna announce her name for Afro Ball and be like, uh, sis. <laughs> Work me through this. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. 
Um, and so, yes, this beautiful queen, she is the founder of Habesha Networks, uh, the biggest um, organization of Habesha people. And for those who don't know, Habesha is a term used to describe people of Ethiopian and Eritrean descent. And so he's created an organization that connects, uh, especially I would say like the millennial population across the diaspora and the continent to their cultural heritage and also educates the greater community on what it means to be Habesha. So yeah, okay, I see the Habeshas in the house going crazy. <laughs> All right, y'all. So let's get into this. Um, I could talk to y'all about Pan-Africanism, about the diaspora for, for like 12 hours. But since we only have one, I'm going to get straight into it. I'd love to hear how you individually identify. And um, since I've described what Pan-Africanism is to the greater audience, if you can kind of describe what that means to you growing up, you know, in the, the city that you're from. I know Jesse's in New York. A lot of us are in Los Angeles <laughs> from Britain. What does that Pan-African like based on all of your experiences of the relationships and, and, uh, and you know, professional um, experiences, again, that you've had. We can start anywhere. Um, I'll say, well, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and, um, but, you know, I grew up with uh, Haitian parents. And my mom, growing up, she always wore um, the... Uh, oh my God, why am I not getting it right? I don't want to say dashikis, but traditional the, attire. Yes, the traditional African attire. She always did that. She always, you know, just in her own way, just reminded us that, you know, yes, we're Haitian, but we are African. You know, that's something that she always did. And in Miami, there's a lot of anti blackness, there's a lot of, you know, pro. I don't know, pro-Hispanicism, pro-white. And, um, but then, you know, growing up Haitian, it was just really, really rough. And then, you know, my African friends, they had it rough too. You know, it was really, really rough. But I think that, I just think, I'm thankful that my mom instilled um, in us, in me, to know where I come from, that yes, we're Haitian, but we are from Benin, we are West African, you know, to know our roots, because I think that, now that's just carried over to me and even now my platform yeah i go hard for haiti but i go hard for nigerians i go hard for you know um ghanaians i go i go hard for everybody that's part of the diaspora because like at the end of the day we all african i always say that we all this is an african page i always say that this is an african page this is an african home <laughs> so um yeah, that, that's just my take on it. Awesome. We see that too, definitely. It comes across. <laughs> I guess I'll go next. Um, I identify um, first and foremost, um, yeah, I identify as Ethiopian, I identify as Habesha, I identify as African, American, Black, I identify as a lot of things. Um, I grew up actually in Orange County, so if any of you guys know what that is or where that is, um, it's predominantly just white. Uh, there's about two, two, three percent black population. Um, so I actually always grew up being, feeling and being different, which I didn't think was a bad thing at all. Um, I grew up in a household where we were very cultured, so we did, I mean, we kept the culture alive, no matter what we were doing. Um, and it wasn't something we were ever ashamed of. We always, I mean, like when I would have friends come over, I would make them try Ethiopian food. Um, when there was anything that we could do, like I always wanted to educate people. If anything, I thought like, hey, it's so cool. I come from this really dope country. This is the cool things we get to do. And I just love being, I, I love being African. I didn't, I mean, of course people make fun of things and they, especially cause like South Park was big too. So they used to call us like starving Marvin, which I hated. But for me, I was like, you guys don't even know how beautiful and dope Ethiopia is. So it's like, if anything, I felt bad that everybody was so ignorant and they thought like, we're all just like what they thought of us. You know, but I was super prideful and proud growing up. Like I even had um, my car license plate when I first got my uh, car. Um, it said, no girl, because I was all about repping really tough. I was like, I want you to hear me. I want you to see me. Like everything's about like holding it and representing So, Yep. I love that. Who wants to go next? Keyboy, maybe? Sure, I'll go. Um, okay. So I, I, I guess, refer to myself as Afro-Trinidadian. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, born and raised. 
Um, it's crazy. I have not even been to Africa yet, but you know, my dad was very Afrocentric. Afrocentric. He was into you know the African culture. My name is my names are Kibwe Kamwe Kari, and my last name is Trim. Kibwe Kamwe Kari, blessed king. This man gave us all African names. His name is Joel, by the way. I'll just you know throw that out there, but he gave us all African names. And he, you know, he instilled in us this value of, you know, this is where we're from. This is where you need to be proud of. Yeah, we are in Trinidad right now, but you know, African slaves came to Trinidad to work on the sugarcane plantations. And you know, that's where our lineage is from. So at the end of the day, we are all Africans. He was very proud of that. Um, you know, coming from Trinidad where it's predominantly, you know, it's about 49% black, about 49% Indian and the other 2% mix. You know, most of the people are black and brown anyway. So it, there was no, I didn't ever feel like there was there was something against being proud to be African. It was, you know, it was just, that's what it was. And that's what our father and mom instilled in us. And I mean, you know, till this day, I'm a proud Trinidadian, but I'm a proud Afro-Trinidadian. I love that. Who's next? Why are you guys acting shy? Like, I know all of you. <laughs> yeah. Same for Jesse. I mean, you know what we, we have that in person. So I was like, same for Jesse. I know all of you. And this quiet act that you're doing is not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shy. Um, I, can okay. jump, I can jump in here. I was having a bit of a. Okay, go ahead, Brett. Okay. Um, <laughs> Brett? Sorry. Like my, looks like my internet is having a bit of. Yeah, my. Can you hear me? Can you guys? We can hear you. Yeah. yeah, I was having a bit of an issue, but yeah, um, I identify as African American because you know I, I grew up here. You know, my family is from here. Although, um, you know, urban heritage on my on my uh, on, on one of my sides of my family, but you know, I grew up here. All my experiences have been here. But you know, as a you know as a growing up, you know my mom always instilled in me that you know yeah we're african we're african you know we are you know we're african but you know we we're our nationality is that of america you know always you know have a you you know it's funny like in all of my travels as i tell people there's various experiences that one has there's like you know folks say well as an american, what's your experience like when you travel and i'm like well there is an American experience, but then there's a, a black experience, which is like the collective. And so, you know, no matter where I go, yeah, you know, my racial background uh, trumps, you know, my nationality. No one knows I'm American, no matter where I don't go. They see it, you know, they see a black person. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, as an African American, again, you know, we grew up, the way that I grew up, the way that I was brought up was really just you know, to embrace, you know, embrace our heritage. And I was a kid in like fourth and dashikis. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always been something that's been a part of, uh, you know, of my heritage, you know, growing up. So that's it in a nutshell. I love it. And you wearing one right now. <laughs> I am. I, am. <laughs> I figured it was appropriate for today, so. Brett actually came to our first Afro ball in a full Agbada, I think, right? I did. You came in traditional Nigerian attire. Yeah. How did you hook I that did, up? I did. Like yeah. a Nigerian homie, like awesome. Well, Love you it. know, so again, who's I, next? Yeah. Uh -oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> now you gotta tell us it's, it's just that delay in the in, in the internet. We care. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's I don't know what's going on with my internet. I swear, you know, I pay the bill. I think it's uh, I got the good stuff. Um, but you know, apparently it's uh it's tripping right now. But yeah, no, nah, I saw I literally I got with a couple of my um my Nigerian friends I grew up with, and I was like, hey, I'm going to this event. So you know, you gotta you gotta hit me as to what I should wear that's uh you know most appropriate and so forth. And so yeah, now they, they tutor me you know went through like all right this is what you wear here this is what you wear here and then 
boom. I went to a, I went to a shop that I know of. It's actually owned by some Senegalese people. I was like, yo, this is what I need. And um, got it tailored. Yeah. You saw Mr. Fall. I already know you saw Mr. Fall. <laughs> but we'll talk about that on the side. <laughs> I, I did. I did. All right. Definitely. Definitely. I love that. So fool me, fool me, please. So, Bag, tell us, tell us a little bit about your identity. So I'm listening to all of you and I'm kind of like looking at the comments at the same time because people are chiming in and it's interesting because, you know, as we all break down our different identities, I see one comment say, you know, we need to drop the American part because if, you know, because I've read, um, you identified as African American and so African American and somebody said we need to drop the American part because that's not our nationality that we are. Essentially, I'm, if I were to guess, I think that this person was trying to assert that we are all one African people and that our different kind of ethnicities divide us in some particular way or our different nationalities when we should just identify as black. And I will just say this, to answer the question, that's very interesting to me because um, I identify as Nigerian American. Um, some people would identify me as like an American of Nigerian descent, you know, um, but I know what I identify as a black woman. And why is it that, um, you know, that I would still keep the American part because being born and raised in America is a significant part of my identity, regardless of the fact that my entire lineage is Nigerian. You know, it's a significant part of how I view the world and see the world and, and how I function and operate because of the cultures within America. Um, but also, I think that it's really um, that when we talk about identity, which I know we're going to jump into in a second, it's relatively um, a controversial thing to ask someone to drop the American in their identity, knowing that their ancestors um, essentially uh, built this land. And so that's why a lot of uh, Black American people specifically refuse to drop, you know, the American identity because essentially, how do you um, forego the identity and the rights that, that essentially your ancestors fought and, you know, essentially built this land? So what does it mean to then disinvest from an American identity. But I would say I am an African woman, I am a Nigerian American, and a Black woman. Everywhere I go in the world, I'm Black, um, and I rep that. And um, I happen to believe that all of us identifying as one Black people is for our benefit. Well, I 100%. I have more to say. <laughs> I will say one more thing. Um, when I was coming up um, as a little girl for the first 17 years of my life, I was the black girl in white spaces because I went to predominantly white school. So I was the black girl in white spaces. When I got to college, you know, when I'm 18 years old, I became the African girl in predominantly black and brown spaces. So my identity has actually been relatively malleable based off of whoever I'm surrounded by. Not to say that I change based off of my environment, but the way that people perceive you changes off of your environment. Because now once I'm around black American girls, they're not viewing me as the black girl, but I am like, oh, you African? Oh, you different. And, it's, and that's how the identity, be, identity becomes malleable. Come on, malleable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I resonate. That resonate too, because I have the same exact identity um, born and raised in Los Angeles, I'm first generation, which means my entire lineage is is in Nigeria. First to be born here though, and so the American identity is very important for me as well, because growing up, I too was the only, the only black child. I went to private school for a while. Rich white folks right. in the valley, yeah. movie directors, so and so and so and so. I was not just like, the only black girl. There was no black boy in any of the grades for like two or three grades. And when my mom got to the school, she like found the black parent and was like, this is my daughter. <laughs> like, you know? And like the kids were like 12 and I was five and I was like, they're never gonna play with me. But like, I guess it's cool to know like where the black kids are on campus. Um, and that was my identity. So very much in the same sense, I never was ashamed to be Nigerian because there was no one to make me ashamed about it. Um, of get my parents a little bit for their pronunciation of things. I, as a, a child coming up, would take the way that they pronou uh, pronounce words because I'm learning a language as a as a child, right? And I would go to like school and then say like embarrassed, and people would be like, 
like, uh, embarrassed, you know, and it's like, how do I get an exit being in Hawthorne and Gardena in LA? <laughs> Right. So that that did I did I did kind of get on my parents internally within the house discussions about just, you know, how we go and pronounce words. But, you know, I remember being offended the first time my black American friend told me that they weren't African American. And I was like, African, you know, she they're like, I'm not African, I'm black. And I was yeah. like, Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> you know, and this was like a middle school level conversation and I and I took it and I respected it. She's one of my best friends to the day, the only person I'm still friends with from age 12 to, to now, but I didn't quite get it. And it took a little bit of time and more life and experiences from understand exactly what you were saying for me and a couple others, uh, other of you have said about the way that it's very important when you don't have a direct link and the privilege that comes along with understanding where your heritage is from, that you don't try to erase the identity of the people who built this country. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. Like, first, I wanna get off the North American continent to uh, UK, Great Britain, our resident, Black Britain, Mr. Daps, please. I'm ready to see what accent you're gonna give us. <laughs> um, so I think, um, yeah, I think it's very interesting hearing hearing all parts of everyone's you know story and heritage and lineage. I think I've had a quite interesting experience because I lived in all three continents. I was born in Nigeria. I've lived in Nigeria. I was uh, raised in London and I'm also, lived in America. And I think for me, being Nigerian in London isn't difficult because London is basically like Lagos. I don't know, it's like, like it's a lot of Nigerians in London. So like you don't you don't have to um, assimilate as much as I felt like you have to being African in America. So growing up in London, it was always Nigerian weddings and Nigerian parties and Nigerian friends and family and everyone around me is Nigerian. Uh, my parents spoke Yoruba to me. My mom spoke Yoruba in the house. I still, I still understand Yoruba. Um, you know, go to Nigeria. It's not a far, a far flight from London. You know, seven hours. Um, so being Nigerian in London is quite straightforward. I, I feel like the Nigerian restaurants, markets. You eat Nigerian food every day. It's just basically being in Lagos, but being cold. Um, and gray and wet. Uh, everyone's got a bad attitude. Um, so, but then when I came to America the first time, I was 17 when I was, when I was still playing basketball. And I went to a private white high school in Connecticut for a year. Then my first college was in North Carolina. And then that's when I was around a lot of African Americans, like school wise. And, I, and, I, and then that's when I noticed that there was a huge disconnect you know, like you guys have mentioned between Africans and African Americans, where they saw me as different, or oh, your name is funny or weird, or you know, certain like cliche jokes they would make, and I just thought like, but we're the same. But I was like off brand black to them, <laughs> like they were black. Oh, no. Yeah, they were black, black, and I and I was like black by color, but not black by culture, and it's just ironic because. America, African Americans um, don't make up the majority of black people in the world. They're probably the minority, you know. Whereas you have you have you have a country like Nigeria, which is the most populous black country in the world. You have a country like Brazil, the second most black populous country in the world. So African Americans are probably quite far down in terms of what actually means black. Well, so I find sure. it, but yeah, in, in terms of like population-wise, but um, for them, they thought African America was the center. Of blackness and every once again these are blanket statements i'm not trying to make assumptions about everyone this is my experience in north carolina um and every black person that wasn't african-american was basically the other black people um, <laughs> or africans so you know i think i think i think i've had an um interesting experience living living in all three i um i don't identify as american or african-american i don't identify as British identify as Nigerian, and I think that's what, and then sorry, I do identify as British. But if I'm in England and you ask me where I'm from, I'm gonna say Nigeria. Whereas in America, if you ask me where I'm from, I'm gonna say I'm Nigerian, but I grew up in London. So I guess no matter where I am, I just do two steps back or one step back, depending on 
which which uh, country country I'm in. But yeah, it's been it's been a very interesting experience. And yeah, these these are panels and these discussions and you know the year of return in in Ghana. I think it's all very important to bring in the diaspora back together and hopefully to continue these dialogues and have less less uh, judgments and less finger pointings about who's right, who's wrong, and what to call each other, and just basically open up dialogue and let everyone express themselves and their experience, you know, and can't tell because this person is from here, he shouldn't call himself this or or that. I think we should all be open, open, open ears, open heart, and uh, becoming becoming more more as one as we've been doing over the past few years. Definitely, <clears throat> definitely. I think that um, this might be, in, in my experience, you know, as long as I've been on the planet, I would just say that as, as, as much as I've been into this conversation, this might be one of those things where there's like no one right answer um, and trying to all come to this agreement that there is like one way to be black or one true, idea, one macro uh, existence is maybe not the best use of our time and resources. <clears throat> I'd also say that from being born and raised in America and also just being in the media, uh, work, like working in the entertainment industry, I think we also do understand that Black American identity is, it is the culture, period. <laughs> like, without Black American identity, we don't have music, we don't have sports, we don't have culture, we don't have internet culture, we don't have like Twitter, we don't have memes, we don't have slang, we don't have uh the way of, of dressing we saw this jordan documentary just run rap i've never owned a pair of jordans in my life but i you'd have to live under a rock not to know what a, like a jordan shoe is or who michael jordan is or what you know what the, the story is about that so i would i would pose that question to the chat and and to the group you know I, we don't have time to really go there but just about the fact what you said about you know there is this disconnect uh with americans in general <laughs> our education is not up here um, and so we don't, when you haven't traveled out, you really don't, not like black American, white Americans, Asian Americans, you do not have a very good sense of like what the rest of the um, And it's very, very like um, ethnocentric and nationalist. So that is part of the reason why, you know, you might meet a black British person or a, a Caribbean or person and be like, uh, off brand black, we don't only black. <laughs> I don't know that, <laughs> you know, but I do like, you know, uh, Right, peas and rice, you know, <laughs> but it's just not, you know, um, and so that's something that we we should we should keep in mind. So that now that I have you though, Daps, I wanted to stay here. I was gonna ask a little bit later, but someone brought up in another. It was actually a uh, Nomzamo, a South African actress in the media panel. She brought up that that moment in the Spike Lee. Uh, She's got to have it Netflix adaptation where the black actress on screen is speaking to a black British actor and says something along the lines of like black British um, actors don't have the experience, uh, black British ones in general don't have like the, the, the experience of like a greater struggle. And so it's really inappropriate the way that black British actors are proliferating the the entertainment space and we can see that with people like Damson Idris who is the star of Snowfall which is about you know um crack and 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 um the the drug infiltration in black communities in the 80s and 90s we see that with Daniel Kaluuya starring in Get Out um which is a story about you know being black and <laughs> falling into the sunken place when you get too close to white people and now potentially starring as Fred Hampton the um Black Panther Party leader who was assassinated by the FBI. And so Black American people are asking, well, why is it that these Africans and Black Britons yeah, yeah, should yeah. Come and play our roles when there's a perfectly good Af African American Black actor who could do it? I've actually, I've actually had this conversation a few times. I've actually, I've actually had this conversation a few times in the past few weeks. And the answer is probably way more simple than anyone <laughs> wants to admit. but the real answer as to why it's happening uh once again blanket statements generalizations a lot of british actors grew up going to drama school a lot of british actors grew up uh, studying in the theater a lot of british actors didn't get their first big role until they slaved slaved away at crappy roles learning the arts learning the thespian side of it for years and years and years and years um not only that but because being in being black in britain we are more uh i would say worldly perhaps so we grew up with certain uh 
luxuries, i.e. knowing people from different um, countries and listening to different languages. And we grew up on American culture and on British culture. So I think our worldview is different. And when you take that into your work, take that into your um, interview, or you take that into your casting audition, it shows. So I think a lot of black British actors might have had more real thespian artistic acting experience than the average American actor a lot of times, right? And then, so that's on the actual practical side of why it's happening perhaps, you know? So, you know, Damson is my friend. John Singleton did not want a non-LA person playing Franklin in um, Snowfall. I was here when Damson was flying over to audition and cast for that. John Singleton did not want that. And John Singleton is LA and LA through and through. And Damson convinced him otherwise. So at the end of the day, in that situation, and a lot of situations, it's about the, the, the uh, talent came through. Um, now, that being said, is there an issue with Black Brits coming and doing Martin Luther King roles and Harriet Tubman roles and Queen and Slim roles and these really important Black roles? Something about it isn't right. I don't know what's wrong with it. It's not. But something about it isn't right. <laughs> and I think... I don't have an issue with it either, right? But something needs to be, once again, spoken about, dialogue created. I'm not sure what the answer is, but it's interesting as to why Black Brits are getting historical African-American roles. Um, I don't agree with, or we didn't go through the struggle part, like you went through the struggle part, but something about it is unbalanced, perhaps, in a lot of cases. So I can't sit here and say, oh, we're all the same and we should get every role we want now. I think there should be some kind of dialogue there. I just don't know what the baseline answer is or the, uh, or the uh, solution. I think, can we interject? Yeah. We can, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm going to take one last well, comment on this and then I'm going to take it in another direction. Yeah. I think there's a, lot of pro there's a lot of issues with that because, like, for instance, right, I'm Haitian and um, I see that every time there is a Haitian role, so a, 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 a role where Creole has to be spoken um, in movies and, and television, I always see a non-Haitian person doing it. The accent is terrible. The Creole is horrible. I saw a clip not too long ago uh, with Remy Ma, and she did something in Queen and uh, uh, she did something with Queen of the South. It was on Netflix. And she had a scene where she was speaking Creole and it was, it was horrible. Mm. It was horrible. And it's like, it's 2020. It's not that hard to find someone that can speak the language and that can convey the message appropriately so that the audience um, doesn't lose sight of that, the language, the culture, the energy, you know what I mean? And I feel like, um, when you see people being upset, when you see African-American uh, people being upset at someone like Cynthia Rivos playing Harriet Tubman, right, rightfully so, because it's like, okay, can we go and play a British role? Probably not. Not saying that it has to be that way all the time, but it's getting to the point where it's like, okay, these major roles though, Come on, the major roles, goddamn! Y'all couldn't find nobody here that could do this. Like you couldn't find nobody that could play. You know what I'm saying, Martin Luther King? It's kind of like, mm. like I get it. With British mm. actors, they definitely spend time in theater. Like if you do your research, they go hard and they do spend time in theater. But so do African American um, actors that have longevity. Sure. So you look at someone like Denzel Washington, yeah. Yeah. theater. You look at someone like Viola Davis, theater. Angela, Angela Bassett, Bassett, theater. <laughs> yep. Okay, like these people who who we're talking about the people who have had longevity, they studied that. They went to Juilliard or they went to NYU or they went to they went to um Yale. what's that the, the 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 HBCU that everybody every black actor comes from? Where is it where is it from again? Um Lord Howard. Howard. They went to Howard University. Yeah. Howard. Right. So it's like they they went there and but it just seems like with those with the american actors though when you look at when they were first starting out they were not getting those big roles so then it's like when you see these younger british uh, uh, um younger black uh, uk actors coming in and they're getting a harriet tubman in their 30s 
versus how long did it take for Denzel Washington to even get an Oscar? Like, he had to do all these different things to even start getting the big roles. So it's like, there's a lot of, mm, it's like you see both sides. You can see you can see the pros and the cons on both sides. I feel like we yeah. could go for on a tangent all the way like for, for a couple mm -hmm. of hours just talking about the disparities in the entertainment industry, the representation, what shade of black women we see when roles are taken, et cetera, et cetera. I think we could do that for a long time. I don't want to digress too far. I know that's my fault because I just had to ask that question um, and it came up another mm -hmm. panel. But um, definitely something that we need to um, address and fix as, a, along with a, a bunch of other um, things that are wrong with the industry at the moment. But I actually want to throw this question to Maylot. Um, who's been a bit quiet. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm an author do with Habesha Networks, and we've had the opportunity to partner on a couple different things. Um, and, you know, there's this, like, unspoken, I wouldn't call it attention, but like, there's this unspoken, like, separation between, like, Ethiopia, Eritrea, like, kind of East Africa, and, like, West Africa. And I don't want to go into that. Because it's after the day we unite <laughs> So we're not going to talk about or try to flesh out the reasons why, because in the same sense, Ethiopia is, is, is the birthplace of so much. And it was, the, you know, the, the setting for those early conversations with the African Union, as well as having this trans-African reach, you know, even with, like, the link between Jamaica and Ethiopia, Pali Selassie, and, like, the Rastafari movement and things like that. So just asking you as a young organizer and leader in creating this global African community, do you find it to be like an extreme responsibility to not just create the platform for Habesha people, but also posit Ethiopia and Eritrea as like the starting ground for these bigger conversations? And I, and I know that Habesha Network organized uh, 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 going home to Ethiopia mm -hmm. at the same time as the year of the return. So now we have like Ghana and Ethiopia uh, as these strong movements, but the Ethiopia homegoing didn't get as much traction or, or media uh, presence. Um, and so yeah, what, what do you think that that responsibility is for you? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a loaded question. A <laughs> good one though. Um, I mean, trying to create this global community and especially connecting it to not just um, like we say this all the time for our events or our programs, we want to make sure to make it inclusive to everybody because I have a lot of, I know a lot of people who are so connected to the culture and community and to the country who know more than Ethiopian and Eritreans themselves and who aren't. So one, there has to just be a level of inclusivity that doesn't really happen. Um, I think we try to label everything and you've either got to be exactly this or that. And I think so much, and that's what happens. We're so divided because even with Ethiopia, I mean, if you're not a certain tribe from a certain religion, like the division already starts there. So I think because it starts from home in that respect, that of course it's gonna kind of trickle into um, other spaces. But I, I think that's the biggest thing that we're trying to do is change that narrative and move towards a more collective um, culture that lets us be proud of where we're from, but again, accepting and loving the other parts of Africa and um, black unity. Um, in regards to our trip with like homebound and what we were trying to do with that is we want to give people opportunities to go back home to put their like to invest and to look at doing more than just going to go visit family or go party, right? Like we all have different experiences when we go home, but we don't get those opportunities to really connect back to what's going on, what's the resources in the country, what are opportunities for me to go back and actually prove and do something there instead of you know, sometimes we just get so close-sighted and we just look at what's in front of us and we don't remember and think about what we have back home too. So for us, it was like, how can we find a way to let people get connected to the locals and locals be connected to diaspora? So that's why we did it. Definitely. I want to hear from Brett. <laughs> Brett, you've been really quiet. You good? <laughs> so sure. I, okay, cool, cool, cool. So I recently uh, facilitated on a program um, in the Watts neighborhood. Uh, it was a, a eco sustainability uh, compost hub, uh, and it really opened my eyes because I typically work in entertainment space. I'm a creative. I'm in music. I'm in you know social and digital and things like that. I don't. Uh, I, although I am in the nonprofit space, I'm, I'm not typically working with the community in this particular type of way. And it really opened my eyes to the ways that being from Los Angeles. The culture is changing. Uh, the history is being rewritten. 
and black communities are at risk of being completely pushed out of their historic um, cities um, and like, you know, yeah. kind of cut out of, of, of what the changes are that are taking place rapidly in the city. And so in your position um, in the city of Inglewood, and then in this like greater, you know, black existence and community, I have two questions. One, what can we do to preserve our black spaces? what can we really do you know to preserve our black spaces um is this an economic question is this an education question is this literally like yourself like running for positions or like applying for positions within the city and then my second question is um there is a little armenia in, you know here in la there's a little tokyo thankfully we have little ethiopia because i don't know where i'd get my injera my dorawat without it <laughs> but what do you have to do to to actually get something like that done within a community? Um, and do you think that, that it's important that, for instance, like Caribbean and African um, communities push to have more smaller pockets like that? Is would that help with the preservation of like African uh, of of Black culture? And also, would it kind of be shutting out the American um, contribution as well if those communities continue to pop up? Yeah. Um, well. Yeah, with respect to blacks and so forth, you know, throughout the the general greater area being pushed up, you know, I think it's really more so a question of a, there's a lot of systemic institutional challenges that you know that obviously the United States faces. I mean, um, you have primarily the people that are moving into these areas that are that are largely they're largely white, and you know, second to them would probably be you know uh, Asians, but largely white folks. And if you look at just the you know historic access to the capital that they've had over the you know over decades, I mean that's largely it. I mean, um, so you know what's happening here in Los Angeles is happening in D.C. It's happening in Houston, you know anywhere where there's a, an ethnic club of African Americans. Generally speaking, the areas tend to be a little bit, you know, they tend to have historically been expensive. And what's happening is that, you know, essentially you have white people that are pricing out other white people and it's causing those white people that can't afford to live in traditionally white areas to take, right. you know, the money that they've been right. moving to, you know, um, black areas. So how do we preserve that? Well, I mean, it's it's multi-pronged because the issue is so, is so complex. You know, the median, you know, incomes and net worth and so forth you know, you have a lot of black folks that, you know, have to, you know, to purchase, you know, you know, so I think that's, that's one thing, you know, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a multitude of different solutions. I mean, it's a matter of figuring out ways, you know, to, to own property, if that's, you know, if that's a possibility, um, you know, pulling resources, things of that nature. But I mean, but again, there's, it, it's, the issue itself is complex and rooted and embedded so deep in a lot of the issues that the United States has that it, it's a, uh, it's to say the least. But, you know, I do think, you know, things such as, you know, for example, you mentioned some of the other communities, well, you know, like Lamert Park, for example, you know, has long been uh, the hub, if you will, um, modern hub of African culture. It was like Central Avenue at one point, but um, since that kind of changed, Lamert Park is, has kind of been that stronghold. So organizations that are working with some of the local elected officials to try to figure out ways to create spaces in this general area. Um, the one thing I'd say is, you know, there's a lot of people I think there's been a lot of folks that um, traditionally, you know, once they, you know, get a position or they come in, or whatever the case may be, you know, the idea is to always to move out. The more people, such as you know, such as ourselves, that have the opportunity or the ability to root ourselves, you know, in our communities, um, I think that's you know, I think that's one of the areas where it can also start as well. So you know, instead of if you you know, if you have a couple of dollars and start moving out to you know somewhere else, stay put. So you know, and, and, and you know, so yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things. But again, it's it's a it's such a complex issue that it's kind of hard to come up with um, one solution. But I will say this as well. I mean, with respect to some of the the smaller, some of the smaller um, subgroups within just the black experience. I mean, there is like a little Belize that's pretty, you know, pretty close to Lamar Park. 
Um, you know, so I mean, there are those there are those little areas that are you know, although not necessarily like an official area, uh, right, recognized by the city. But you know, there are some areas that there are some like um, um, you know, African or African diaspora enclaves, if you will. We're having Can a bit I of delay, so I'm not sure. A little bit on <laughs> Sure. Sure. No, I'm, I'm hearing Brett and I'm, I'm agreeing and, and it is complex, but I will say um, that while it is complex, there's something about it that also feels relatively sim simple to me that we understand that like black people in America specifically, if we're talking about America, have had this long standing history of economic injustice and not having access to the same economic resources you know, that other Americans, specifically their white American counterparts have had access to because of redlining, because of this longstanding history of just black American people not having the same access even to educational resources, the same types of jobs, not getting paid the same amount as their white counterparts, um, not getting the same loans, which then leads to this whole history of economic injustice and the lack of socioeconomic mobility, even if it is earned, right? And so then if you, it's obvious that there's this long history, well, then what happens when people don't have access to the money that they should have because of discrimination? They piece their money together and work together in order to get access to whatever thing that they're trying to get access to for their community. And so when it comes to gentrification, that looks like land. That looks like businesses. That looks like real estate. You buy it together in a way where then other communities cannot come and snatch it up. Now, how can that happen? It can only happen if a, 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 conglo a conglomerate of black people in these um, in these historically black communities agree that this is what we're going to do, whether it be, you know, 10,000 different households in the community agree we're all going to give five dollars and then they raise that money and then they buy some property or they buy a business or they buy whatever it may be. That can only happen if everybody agrees to do that. But part of the issue is that because we see ourselves as so different, we will we refuse to agree because we don't see our destinies as linked. I don't want to speak broadly, but lots of black people don't necessarily view our destinies as linked, but then we will get online and say, how dare they shoot Ahmaud Arbery in cold blood, Black Lives Matter, but then the next day say, you know, I'm not I'm not, uh, I'm Nigerian, you're Ghanaian. No, you're Ghanaian, I'm Kenyan. No, you're Kenyan, I'm Haitian, right? We have a link, we have to actually be able to agree enough to decide to do something together. And what do I mean by that? We have plenty of people in our communities, in, in Black American communities, that um, believe that we can work and do, so you can say, uh, racial, economic collectivity and work together economically, collectively. That was part of the principles within the civil rights movement, Black nationalism. That's part of the principles of Pan-Africanism. It was part of the Black power movement, economic collectivity. Nip, but there's plenty of people in our community that don't believe in um, that do believe in economic collectivity. There's plenty of people that don't believe in capitalism. So what do you so so you understand what I'm saying? You can have people that sure. are saying gentrification is wrong, but also then saying capitalism is wrong. And then what th then what do we do with that if if we're if people are disagreeing? I want to say I want to give a little bit of context before I wrap this up. Nipsey Hussle is a Eritrean Amer was an itch is and was an Eritrean American man who believed in economic advancement of the black community. Um, he was of African lineage, but he was invested in uplifting black America and you know the global international black community. So in many regards, he had a Pan-Africanist ideology. But you know, as when Nipsey passed away, so many people mourned and they said, this leader, this fighter, this brilliant man has passed away. This example of brilliant black manhood has passed away. Um, and I saw, you know, one or two comments saying like, oh, you all are lifting him up so much um, for doing all of this wonderful work against gentrification and lifting up the community, you know, but he was a capitalist. I'm, I'm saying this to say that like, we have to understand that like on an ideological level, Part of why we feel like, oh, all of us agree, things need to change, but things don't change is because we never get past the very just line of, I don't know if we agree on uh, economic justice or if we agree on gender justice, if we agree on these things. So part of the reason why other communities are able to do the things that they do economically and buy up 
whole communities, Jewish communities, buy up whole communities. You understand what I'm saying? Um, is because they across differences, they will agree, okay, I'm I might not like you, but I'm gonna give my five dollars and we're gonna buy up that land right there. I vote you for president. <laughs> I said, listen. I was in the chat like Fumi Lala for president. We, Where do I start? Fumi Lala, oh, yes, that that. For, uh, <laughs> 2024. He said, "What? What? 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 Again, some of these concepts need more space. Uh, the, the conversation about capitalism, anti-capitalism, black billionaires, um, where the, the black identity, the Eidos movement, yeah. reparations for black American people first, right? And, and so we, we have so many places that we can go. And, and for me, since we're on you, I was gonna bring up the intersection of woke black folk. Um, this play that uh, that you wrote, this incredible play I've had the, the privilege of, of being able to see in person um, that you've toured the world with. Um, and that started as just a, what, yes. a, a video, right? It's really good. And um, the video green traction, it's really, listen, I'm like, I should find the link and drop it in the, in the chat, but y'all need to see this play. Um, uh, and if you can't see the play, the video that Fumi wrote, it's called The Intersection of Well Black Folk. Um, and it is a stage play on the complexities of black political identity and a story about how humans navigate difference. This project has been met with critical acclaim by thinkers and artists such as Angela Davis and Eric Badu. And Fumi, you have sat in rooms with great leaders, with great uh, thought leaders, your peers, uh, with the president of France, you know, you are a professor, you are with your students, and you're also one of the founding members of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. So you touch a lot of spaces, then you're Nigerian, and then you're an artist, and then you're a woman. I wanna start with you, but this is a question for all of us. What is the answer? <laughs> it's a million dollar question. What is the answer for A, tying that black identity that we need to have in order to build what we are just discussing, that what both you and Brett are discussing in order for us to preserve our spaces, but also recognizing the fact that we are not going to agree on the methods, the ideology, the political stances, um, what things should go first right off of the bat. And so how do we suss that out? And does that um, that archetype or that, that um, that basic pillar of understanding, does it work across the diaspora? I know this, these concepts can work in the West because we are privileged when we are in the West where we can say certain things about our government and our administration and not be snuffed off the face of the earth. I was listening to a podcast about uh, the, the protests that were happening in China and how you know a young journalist was just uh, taking account of what was going on in the podcast. And when the, the program ended, they said that they actually hadn't heard from him for about two weeks. He'd been messing, his family hadn't heard from him. That is where we are living in, this is 2020, y'all. You don't understand how easy it is to go on our, our you know, black Twitter and say whatever we want about this president and not be worried about people coming to us in the middle of the night. So what does this look like in places like Brazil, in places like, you know, uh, uh, all across the world? Yeah. So. Whoever wants to start for me, if you want to start. I mean, you know, you asked a very specific question of like, is this the same principle that is existing across the international black world? Like that we just need to almost kind of get past our differences in order to engage in a collectivity. Like that can, my play is specifically about like black American identity. And I will say this briefly, when I first wrote the poem that became the whole entire stage play, I was afraid, I had a fear to put it out because I felt like black people specifically were going to be frustrated with me for pointing out our our differences in such an obvious open way. It's almost like, you know, we do this thing where it's like, yes, black power, black unity. But I wanted to really look at the ways in which um, we can sometimes devalue each other in a way that is a reflection of the way that systemically, historically, we've been devalued under white supremacist regimes. And so it's not the same, but there are some similarities in the, even the way that we devalue each other, meaning that I can't deal with this other black person because you know they're entirely different, they're different from me. And so what do I mean by that? I, in, in the play, I present the fact 
of that the, the truth oftentimes is complex, that somebody can be both right and wrong at the same time. I will say that human beings overall struggle with this principle. Either they think somebody is brilliant or they think somebody is a fool. And oftentimes, the brilliant person can be wrong and that fool can say something right. And we struggle with that overall. But I will say that um, that, that cha those challenges and, and dealing with each other across difference is part of what I deal with in my work. As it pertains to globally, just to touch on it briefly, Pan-Africanism is about understanding that we all have a collective Black identity. Um, in Brazil, or in America, we're dealing with Donald Trump. In Brazil, they're dealing with Bolsonaro. The person that is in charge of um, that's the president, but the person that is in charge under Bolsonaro's regime is somebody uh, um, to to defend black rights under this regime is somebody that doesn't believe that racism is really that significant um, to to begin with, right? And that you know if that slavery wouldn't have happened if Africans just wouldn't have you know tossed their own people away and just kind of really minimize the the historical significance of what slavery was in Brazil and in the states. And so essentially. What I'm getting at is the fact that in order for us to do this uh, work of collectivity, um, we would have to understand that we benefit from our linked interest in being able to be able to work together and decide that we're going to be a global body as opposed to um, just our local national bodies. And Black Americans would benefit from this in a very specific way because Black American people, because um, Afro, Latino, and Latina and Latinx people are a people that were taken away from the land in which they derived. And the only way for them to really get access to truly taking their own local spaces to court and, 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 and demanding their civil and human rights is if an African country will stand up for them, just in the same way that to wrap it up just in the same way that during World War II, Japanese American people were put in internment camps and that was a human rights violation. And Japan went to the UN and said, you cannot do that to our people. Yes, they're American, but those are our people and right. you, need to, you need to do something about this. Japanese American people got access to reparations because of the fact that Japan was like, you will not do that to our people. Who would do that for Afro-Brazilians? Who will do that? for black Americans. It would have to be an African nation, but who, which one? We, we, and Eidos is like, we are not even, you know, part of those African people, we're right. black American people. So what I, I say all of that to say that there is actually a significant power in numbers, not only economically, but on a global body, like UN world scale, if that makes sense. I'll say, I'll say this, um, there's definitely a lot of division within just the, 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 the diaspora you know in in total and it's really sad sometimes like the other day i was on twitter you know we've seen all the stuff happening in the quarantine we've seen how white people have been acting up and how the racism is just jumping out every minute and um i tweeted something like you know what black people we just need to leave this we just need to leave america and go start our own shit like <laughs> we just need to leave and i had a lot of African Americans saying, well, no, you Haitians need to leave. You Caribbean people need to leave because y'all come here and y'all think y'all this and y'all think y'all that. And I'm just like, what the hell? Like, I'm just like, how did, how did we get here? <laughs> like, how right. did we get here? Because, you know, and and I didn't participate in any of the discussions further. Anybody who was in my mentions telling me anything like that, I was like, listen, get your demon ass out my mentions. I don't got the time for nothing that's divisive, okay? And I don't got time to be talking right. to Satan like that. I talk to God, I don't talk to Satan. But um, it's just really crazy to me how we're just so divisive within ourselves. It's like, oh, you Jamaican. So you need to be, you Haitian, you need to be, you Nigerian, so you need to, you Ghanaian, and you need to, and this person got the best rights, and this, it's like, you know, just like, just little comments like that will turn into a big, like, culture thing within, within ourselves, and I will never understand that, I mean, I know there's a lot of history behind that, but sometimes I just look at the calendar, and I'm like, yo, we are in 2020, this is 20 freaking 20. And then now we're in a pandemic. 
And now more than ever, you see how if we don't unify ourselves, there's just nowhere to go. Like we're, there's nothing, nobody's, no, everybody loses. Everybody loses because we have, we lack unity. We lack unity, in, um, you know, amongst ourselves. So, you know, it goes back to what you were asking. It's like, how do you even just make that connection amongst all of us? How do you do that? Because there's so much divisiveness between us. And we might not, and I don't think we have, you know, we're over time. We don't have the time <laughs> to start volleying the, the ideas because these are the concepts that, you know, our ancestors and uh, these leaders that have come before us, people who are extremely educated and well-versed in movements and leading countries and communities and, and all of that have been trying to figure out. Um, I do know that, like I said earlier, as having the privilege that we are in a position to do things that our parents probably were not. You know, as I was setting up this hop in, my mom, I, I, I'm at home with my family and my mom was looking at it and she was like, I am so jealous. You know, she was just like, we did not have this, you know, when she was my age. When she got to America in the 80s, she went to historically black college and you know, all she she could put her head down because she was paying, you know, her parents were paying from Nigeria to America, the, the dollar or whatever it cost, you know what I'm saying? So she had to just pay her way to school, not make any friends, and then just try not to have to go back home to Nigeria, right? There's no time to be having these thought-provoking discussions with like fellow Nigerians and other Africans and Black Americans in the diaspora about mm -hmm. how we're going to come together. She was just trying to get her light bill to not be taken off, uh, shut off, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I do want us to not not miss the fact that we are in an incredible time where we can have conversations like this. I don't want COVID to be the only reason why we go, you know, we go online and, and actually sit in, in spaces like this. Because, you know, panels happen, but a panel is a little bit harder to get people together. You know, now you got, you know, someone got to send you a car, maybe fly you out, put you in a hotel, et cetera, et cetera. And it can become a whole thing, right? But we can still continue these conversations on a micro level and then workshop that stuff between us, workshop, you know, the micro of it, and then create, glow, you know, bigger, bigger summits and bigger conversations um, with communities and with, uh, you know, representatives all over the world. And so I'm being told to wrap it up. I, I want to talk forever. I'm really good at it. <laughs> and y'all are really good at it too. So just one more minute. Today, I know, before we can kick that again, to just give us a little bit about um, LA Lime and what you're doing to bring communities together, especially with the length of your background in Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, LA Lime, man. I mean, I, you know, I kind of started LA Lime as a, a networking situation. Um, where I'm from, Lime in Trinidad and Tobago means hang out or get together. And um, so, you know, it's basically LA networking, LA hangout. You know, my uncle used to always tell me, um, access is the cornerstone of power. He repeated that to me all the time. Access is the cornerstone of power. What does it mean? If you have access, you have everything. If you have a strong network, this brings you access. You know, now me playing basketball globally, like I can literally, if I wanted to make phone calls and have a meeting with the president or the vice president of a country. And this is what access was. So when I started, you know, LA Lime, it was about building my access and bringing access to other people, bringing people in the same social networking spaces. You know, business starts with a conversation. Education starts with a conversation. Knowledge starts with a conversation. So that's what LA Lime was. Uh, you know, like I said, it started off as networking, but people like to party, so it turned into a lot of parties. Um, and you know, yeah, so that that's kind of where we're in that space now. We throw a lot of events, we throw a lot of social events, just bringing people together. Just you know, you know, when when people are in the same room, just like we're on here, I'm learning learning a lot by just being here in the same virtual room with all you guys. And yeah, I I don't want to butcher the name, but yeah, top left for president, Funmiola. So yeah, she, <laughs> I mean, this is you know, behind. You. We got we, right. we'll speak up tonight. We'll speak up tonight. I wanna give I just wanna give, give listen until I don't know if they're gonna slide up in this session and kick us out or if they're gonna continue on the main stage, but like I'm I'm literally a very rebellious person. So I'm like I want to, to, to uh, plug what you're working on and let people know where they can follow you and all and all of that. I also want to say just unrelated to this panel altogether for anyone who's still here. First of all, uh people in depth, you guys know each other? 
Mela, I know you want to say one last thing. And, and if you guys just want to jump, jump in the chat, drop your ID, let people know whether you can continue to follow you and all of that. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I know when we were talking about diaspora in Africa, um, we all kind of had that perspective that we're going back to Africa to help them. And something be said that that perspective is not, I mean, it's garbage because there's so much resources and creative and culture in, in all of our countries that we come back kind of that we're doing them a favor. But to be real, I'm, I'm not with that ideology and I'm with the ideology that we all look at our countries at how can we support each other, work into each other's weaknesses for diaspora and for locals and look at it more of like a collaborative collective effort. So I just wanted to say that because sometimes our perspective is like we're doing our, you know, going back home and doing them a favor, but that's not it at all. So. That's real. That's real. Thanks, Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you Thank all you so, so much. much. It was amazing. I appreciate you all. Please take care. Yep. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for watching.